Well, could JT Miller become a member of the Nashville Predators? There are a few articles out there saying the Preds could take a swing at him if he's available. We'll take a look at the potential fit and what it might cost to get him to come here. Plus, controversy in the Stanley Cup Finals. What do you think about the too many men claims that Tampa is making against Colorado on the overtime winner for last night? Plus, we get to the bottom of the who left Roman Yossi off the Nords ballot debate. And Anne has some receipts, baby. Should be an interesting show today. Catch it. The Locked On Predators podcast. Your Locked On Predators, your daily podcast on the Nashville Predators, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Predators your first listen of the day every single day. I'm Nick Morgan. I'm a writer and editor at OnTheForeCheck.com, and I have a partner in crime. You do. I'm Ann Kimmel. I'm a writer at OnTheForeCheck.com. Well, we have some business to take care of. Uh, a couple of different things. Mm-hmm. Number one, we got to the bottom yesterday of who left Roman Yossi off the Norris ballot. Mm-hmm. Uh, it wound up being Scott Powers, who is the athletic writer for the Chicago Blackhawks. Uh I can't remember mm-hmm. exactly. All I know, the one thing that stood out, he had Makar number one, obviously. Okay. The thing that stood out to me, Aaron Ekblad was on his top five and not Roman Yossi. Aaron Ekblad played 64 games this season, i.e. missed like a month and a half due to injury, didn't play down the stretch for the Florida Panthers because he was hurt. Got more votes than the guy who played uh, 80 games and scored 96 points. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've got feelings. Why why don't you shout those feelings (laughs) into the void, man? Leave it off again. I'm going to try to be a little bit more mature today and leave Darcy Kemper's socks out of it, which... Just FYI, I got a flash of that again last night and it was uncomfortable. But back to this. This was Scott Powers. He writes for the Blackhawks. And I thought, you know, maybe he didn't see Roman Yossi play. So I went and looked at the games that the Predators had against the Blackhawks. They had four. Okay, Roman Yossi averaged 25 minutes of ice time in those games. So it's not like he was missing. It's not like he was injured. It's not like he wasn't there. Roman Yossi had three points against the Blackhawks this season, including, including an amazing assist on the game-winning overtime goal to Tanner Janot, where he passed it through two Blackhawks players who shall remain nameless, but I know their names, and one of them's a defenseman. And yet, no Roman Yossi on your ballot? Like, I have so many questions, and I try. I want to phrase them as questions, because otherwise they might come out as accusations. So my question is, what you doing? Like, did you just look at, like, plus minus? Because, like, spoiler alert, not real. Um, how you can look at a season like Roman Yossi had. And I get it. People are like, oh, if you look at it through the lens of purely a defenseman, look at it as purely a defenseman and tell me that you just don't think Roman Yossi is there. I mean, and you can't ignore, you can't ignore the offensive season that he had either. You just can't ignore that. Like, I don't feel like you could say this is the best defenseman in the league and completely ignore 200 foot game like can you focus more on the defense sure but you cannot ignore that and so I just want to know if maybe Mr. Powers was like absent for four games if he didn't know like Roman Yossi's number it's 59 like look for the best looking player playing incredible defense and setting offensive records that was Roman Yossi those four games just FYI 
Like so you just his, can't. So his ballot was Kale McCarr, okay. Charlie McAvoy, Devin Tays, sure, Aaron Eckblad, and Victor Hedman fifth. Um yeah. I mean yeah. we we've said all we've really had to say on this in terms of why we think uh people are leaving Roman Yossi off the ballot or having him ranked low. So at this point it feels like beating a dead horse. Um but I will say Scott Powers, if you're out there, if you're listening, We've had a lot of writers. We've, well, you know, let, let's let's start that again. Scott Powers, if you're out there and you're listening, A, ignore everything I just said because I screwed up the beginning of that segment. <laughs> Number one, you have an open invitation to come on to the show. Yes. Like, we want to hear what you had to say and why you voted the way you did. We've had some people in Nashville, writers, say you should never be allowed to cover the NHL again. We've had some people just call you a flat-out idiot. So what were you thinking? And like, that's not like a that's not like a mean thing. Right. That's just we're genuinely curious why you voted the way you did. And it's not we just Nashvillians who are curious about that. There are other writers for other teams there are other fans of other teams this is just this is not just a nashville question this is a league question what sh what should do in there scott we want to yeah so come on the show shoot us a message let's sum something up uh it can take two seconds it can take 40 minutes however long you want we just want to hear your side of the story like let's hear it like let us see we can talk about blackhawks uh, we can talk about Dropkick Murphy looking hats like the one you got there in your Twitter profile. Uh, it's a nice hat. It's a great hat. A great hat. Um, whatever you want to talk about, we just want to come on and ask you a few questions. So let that be your open invitation to do just that. Yes. Speaking of controversial things, Anne, oh my. last night, game four of the Stanley Cup Finals went into overtime. Mm -hmm. Nazem Kadri scored uh, the game winning overtime goal, which that's a whole different thing for another day. Yes, that was a weird thing. Yeah. The, the thing that came out of it, obviously, uh, John Cooper in the most passive aggressive way possible. <laughs> <laughs> basically says the lightning were robbed and we'll soon see why. And then he basically got up and left. Um, and it, it's, it seems like what he is referencing is the too many men call mm -hmm. from last night's game or lack thereof. Uh, he is claiming the avalanche had too many men. Jared Bednar came out today and basically said, no big deal. Here's my thing. Like looking at the replay, like, I get it. Mm -hmm. Like, I actually do get what he is because I think the argument, um, because I know a lot of people were saying, oh, this happens all the time. Um, I think the argument he was making was that, um, like, Nathan McKinnon wasn't even close to the bench when Kadri jumped off and joined the play. And that was right. kind of the big thing. Because you could see in the background, like, McKinnon was, like, at the bench while Kadri was about to score. And you look at that and say... Uh, yeah, that's not that big of a deal. Um, but when you watch the replay, it does look like Nazem Kadri joined the play way too fast. Mm -hmm. So I, I get that. And I've seen that called, but I've also seen that not called. Right. So here's the thing. Take it from two people who lived through Colton Sissons' Don't notable, even. Where they not even got the call on the ice wrong. They blew the process for reviewing that play. Mm -hmm. So they've got like they not they didn't just get the call wrong, they got the entire rule wrong. So take this from us. Like there are two kind of blown plays. Like there are plays where like this is egregious. This team was absolutely robbed and they deserve some justice. And mm -hmm. then there's the huh. Yeah, that kind of sucks actually. This to me seems more in the latter category. This kind of sucks for the Tampa Bay Lightning. 
But I'm not going to go out and say like this was like this giant oh yeah debacle in which the Lightning should be clutching their pearls for the rest <laughs> of the Stanley Cup Finals. Especially because, let's be honest, this happens a lot. You could probably yes. go through that game last night and find like six or seven shifts where that exact same thing happened. You can also go back to last year's playoffs. Yes. Um, okay, game seven against the New York Islanders. Yep. Remember, they were they got the benefit of one of their players jumping into the play early. You know, on another thing that Barry Trotz thought should have been a too many men call. So this happens a lot. I do feel for the lightning like it sucks. But let's let's be honest, based on how that overtime played out, Colorado is going to win that game anyway. Yes, Colorado was in total control of that overtime period for sure. And I'm with you. You know, it does stink when something is, you know, when an outcome of a game may be based on a questionable call or non-call. You know, they talk to, they do always do an officials debriefing after the game. And in that last night, the officials were asked, hey, did you see this? And not one official, and any official can call too many men. Not one official saw that play. And if they don't see it, they're not going to call it. Does that stink? Sure does. But I have a little bit of grace for officials except Tim Peel. Because I think, you know, you want officials to officiate a perfect game. Well, you know what? If you want a perfect game, execute a perfect game. So, you know, they they didn't see it. They missed it. I can understand the Lightning's frustration with it because I'm with you. I feel like, it. you know, he was in the play a little early. Um, like he shouldn't have jumped into the play with where McKinnon was. I get that. But like, there's no grand conspiracy. I saw some conspiracy tweets, y'all. I'm going to need you to step away from Twitter and and breathe. Because there is no conspiracy in which the NHL is trying to get the refs to rig it so Colorado wins. Like, that's just not yeah. real. Conspiracies only happen when it's against my teams. Right. Like, if the yeah. Predators or Red Wings are involved, then that's when it's a conspiracy. Yeah. Or when there's a hot mic. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Oh, I forgot about that. God. Okay. Yeah. Maybe maybe you can experience a conspiracy there. Who knows? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, maybe yeah. maybe like Wes McCauley will come out on a hot mic and be like, "Man, really glad Nathan McKinnon paid me uh, all that cash. This is great." <laughs> Boat is looking. I great love Wes McCauley because what he would say is he would say, "I'm so glad Nathan McKinnon paid me all yeah. that." Like he would jazz yeah. it up. I love Wes McCauley. Yeah. I'm going to need a bribe of five million. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, he's so delighted. The theater major in me is 100% here for Wes McCauley. 100% every time. Don't even yeah. care. <laughs> there is, yeah, there's definitely a Wes McCauley process towards accepting a bribe. <laughs> Um, <laughs> let's talk about Fred, shall we? JC we Miller. There's a couple of articles out there saying the Predators mm -hmm. could be maybe a player in the JT Miller sweepstakes. We'll have to see. Uh, let's talk about that in a second, but first let's take a break and mention today's show brought to you by our friends at Built Bar who have yet another amazing flavor, chocolate brownie chunk puff. From the people who invented healthy and tasty comes the latest gift to your taste buds. You've probably tried the amazing coconut brownie built bar. Well, they are now in puff form. That's right. The coconut brownie chunk built bar flavor you love in a delicious chewy marshmallow covered in 100% real chocolate. It is a fluffy cloud of coconut brownie goodness. But listen for you. It's not just a sweet treat. They're good for you. They're low calorie, low sugar, high in protein, collagen protein, and all delicious. But coconut brownie chunk puffs are only here for a limited time. So go to built.com now to make sure you don't miss out. They're going fast because they taste amazing. You can enjoy them guilt free because they're good for you. They're the perfect treat. Perfect when you got a craving. Perfect if you need dessert late at night. If you need a sweet tooth in the middle of the day. 
or if you just need a quick, healthy snack, excellent source of protein to keep you full all day long. Don't take our word for it. Try it yourself. Go to built.com. Use promo code locked 15 to get 15% off your order. Again, use promo code locked 15 for 15% off at built.com. Uh, and if you had to assign the nickname chunk puff, <laughs> to the Nashville predators, who would it be? And why? I, you know what? I would go for irony and I would do somebody like David Poyle. Straight irony. Straight. Just because it, it would be like, he's an, you know, he's an older fella. You know, he is um, smaller on the statuesque scale. And I just think you go for the irony. Like we used to have a Beagle Basset Hound that slept all day and we named him Thor for the irony. Like I'm all about that. But somebody needs to be named Chunk Puff. Who would you name Chunk Puff? Isn't Mark Borowiecki looks like a Chunk Puff. <laughs> he's, got, he's got like that little bulldog vibe, but he's also adorable and super sweet. So, And everybody Mark, loves I, him. I think Mark Borowiecki would be a perfect candidate to earn the nickname Chunk Puff in like the most endearing, <laughs> loving way possible. Oh, a hundred percent. Like I would never call Mark Borowiecki anything that did not communicate respect and adoration. And no. I don't know what does more than Chunk Puff. I don't know if I would call him that to his face unless I had like a 10 second head start, <laughs> but I could, yeah, I, if I, if I had like a chance to like shout backwards as like he's chasing <laughs> me, I, and I had like a good amount of time to explain uh, why I feel like he could go for it. Oh my gosh. I adore Mark Borowiecki and the visual of you running away from him yelling, Chunk Puff, it's is really something I hope everybody ruminates on this Thursday. <laughs> this is how I die. Um, yeah. Whew. So, okay. Um, let, let's talk about the Predators offseason. Of course, David Boyle has hinted uh, that mm. there could be some big changes afoot. Uh, yes. And one of them may come in the form of a trade. And now, you know, since it is the offseason, we're kind of looking at routes the Predators can go to revamp the roster. Uh, and I know earlier this week you talked about uh, the second line and some options oh. to boost mm -hmm. that up. Uh, let's talk about maybe a player who's more of a top line guy, more of a big gun, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And that is J.T. Miller. Now, yes. with J.T. Miller – the uh, scenario that is going around. He is coming off a 99 point season. Uh, so yeah, the, the guy can score, um, mm -hmm. but the Vancouver Canucks are kind of in a little bit of a cap tiffy right now. And they have a lot of young players coming up. JT Miller has one year left on a deal that has him $5 million in 250,000 on top of that mm -hmm. in AAV. So they have an affordable contract. They are looking like they may not be able to keep him past next season. So trying to trade him while the value is high. Now, Predators, of course, looking for more big guns, especially up front to uh, kind of, I guess, add to mm -hmm. the, uh, the historic offensive season a couple of players have had. Miller would fit right in. But of course, there's going to be a lot of teams coming yes. after him. Uh, he's a 100 point player, basically, and uh, he has a very team friendly contract. So, and mm -hmm. two things to talk about here. Yes. One is the hockey fit. Mm -hmm. like, do we think JT Miller can be a hockey fit with the Nashville Predators? Who might he play with? How would he fit in? And B is the, I guess, the the fine underwriting of the whole thing. His contract. What yes. might it take to get him from Vancouver? And yeah. do we have a chance to re-sign him beyond this year? And would that make a deal more worth it? So let's start with the hockey aspect. Yeah. How do we see JT Miller fitting into the Nashville Predators? 
This is actually one of the players who I think would be a really interesting fit for the National Predators because I think so much of his game that just is sort of his natural style of hockey meshes very well with the style of hockey that John Hines and David Poyle are trying to grow this team into. I think, you know, he's physical, he's fast, he is no... Um, he is no stranger to play in front of the net. He drives very, you know, he, he's into driving to the net. He also makes shootout goals, which I'm like, we could use some of that. Thank you. Um, but I really think he would be a, a pretty good fit style wise for the Predators because I think he just naturally plays leaning more towards the style where the Predators are headed. Um, so I like this fit just when you stand back and watch what he does. I think it would be an easier fit uh, and less of a kind of style transition than what a lot of other potential trade pieces might be. So this one, this this JT Miller is an interesting one to me for that reason. You know, just for that reason, he has 172 hits this season. So you're looking at somebody who is physical. You're looking at um, somebody with a 15.5% shooting per, uh, percentage, you know, power play goals. This is another area where I'm like, I'm intrigued because eight power well, play goals. Teams. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm thinking, you know what, that, you know, the, the second unit for the Predators power play definitely needs something. And I'm not saying that JT Miller is second unit material, but I'm saying that gives you some more bang for your buck when it comes to special teams. So I just on the surface, looking at it, looking back at his season this past season, this is what I think could be a pretty good fit for the Nashville Predators. I agree. And I think you kind of hit on something when you talked about his style, mm -hmm. because of course the predators, if there's one thing that we've kind of learned from David Boyle and John Hines, it's that they value style mm -hmm. more than, you know, maybe stats or maybe past things, which is maybe kind of a change from when they first brought in like Mikhail Granlin and Kyle Turris um, mm -hmm. and JT Miller does fit the style one of the most underrated things, I mean, he's pretty good defensively as yes. well. Um, spends a lot of time shorthanded. Um, so, you know, if the Preds need kind of a shutdown guy, another high-end penalty killer to put out there with somebody like Mikhail Granlund, a.k.a. a guy who's, you know, one of your, you know, on your top two lines but can also be on the penalty kill and maybe provide a chance at a counterattack, he'd be a guy for that. The interesting thing with JT Miller um, is he didn't really come into his own until he went to Vancouver. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he was kind of more of like a 50 point score when he was with the Rangers. And then when he got traded to Tampa Bay, it really wasn't until he went to Vancouver that he sort of became an explosive offensive guy last year was by far his career best both in goals he had 32 and assists he had 67 mm -hmm. um so that's like the one maybe grain of salt is what do you have to look at with vancouver that maybe he didn't have anywhere else yeah. other than just being used as a top line guy um you know and that's when you kind of have to look out was it the fact that he's playing with elias Pettersson, um and maybe like some more dynamic people and that does have a lot to do with it. But, you know, when you put him next to Matt Duchesne, who also mm -hmm. was a very good playmaker, and instead of Quinn Hughes, you have Roman Yossi back there. I mean, it is very, very possible, very likely, I think, even that JT Miller can kind of reproduce that same kind of offensive mm -hmm. production that he did in Vancouver in Nashville, because I think there is a lot of similarities between the Canucks last year and kind of how um, the people who he was with were built and the star players on the Preds. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think a lot of it, you know, when you talk about sort of that undefinable hockey IQ sort of thing, but I think he reads the ice in a way that's very similar to players like Matt Duchesne or Philip Forsberg, which, you know, we don't know where Forsberg is going to be. But I think he reads the ice 
quickly and as well as, you know, somebody like Matt Duchesne, like this is a playmaker. This is somebody who creates offense, who creates things. And I really like what he could bring to the Predators. And I like what he could bring in, in a top six role. I mean, this is a guy who is going to give you some bang for your buck and not just like you said, it's not just offensively. He, you know, with the physicality, with the way that he plays, I think that just helps generate more opportunities for the predators. They need to make sure that their top six have kind of that physical edge and that maybe the second line didn't necessarily always have or had, but didn't combine that with offensive production. So I I will say I am intrigued by this. I will say also, I worry about what it would cost Nashville. Yeah. And I think that's something that we need to tackle. What would it cost Nashville to bring in JT Miller? And is it going to be worth it? Let's talk about the cost in, in just a second and what mm-hmm. it might take to get him. And, mm-hmm. um, but before we talk about potential trade with JT Miller, let's talk about where we might see him in the lineup. Mm. Um, yes. A lot of this may hinge on Philip Forsberg and his future. Um, but, you know, is he uh, the other end? Like, is he the right wing on Philip Forsberg's line? Is he maybe, do you try to maybe put two big firepower things at once and, you know, load up on your second line, maybe have him kind of be that long lost counterpart to Ryan Johansson. Mm -hmm. Um, And maybe like somebody like Tanner Janot on the other end, somebody like that. That's, that's a fun line to think about. That is a really (laughs) fun line there. Yeah. Um, And uh, I mean, obviously if Forsberg goes, of course, JT Miller is probably going to be on your top line unless there's something else David Poyle has up his sleeve. Um, But yeah, what, where ideally do you think JT Miller would fit and who might his best line mates be? Yeah, I really like um, the idea that if Forsberg stays, that you could plug somebody like JT Miller in on that second line, and you're going to end up with a second line that is going to produce offensively. And that was such a huge miss for the Predators this season. And I love the idea of JT Miller with Ryan Johansson. I think they play a very similar style of hockey. Um, And I think that they... Uh, play with enough of a little bit of an edge that it would kind of elevate that second line as an overall threat on the ice. Anyway, Tanner Janot on the second line intrigues me. And I, and it is one of those things where I think, gosh, do we really want to break up the herd line? I think mm-hmm. it's very obvious that the Predators are going to offer sheet Yakov Trenin, and I don't see them wanting to get rid of him. Colton Sissons is locked in until I'm 85 years old. So You know, you hate to almost break up that third line, but there is a part of me that thinks bumping Tanner Janot up to play with Ryan Johansson and JT Miller. Can you imagine not just the offensive opportunities that you would have with that, but can you imagine the checking that would go on when that line was on the ice? Like that is an absolute dynamo of a line right there, Anne. Yes. I mean, it just the thought of it makes me a little giddy inside. I I think that would bring so much punch to a second line that, you know, the second line was a little bit of a whimper this year and it needs to be more of a punch. And I, you know, you think about that and you think this could be it. Um, I don't know. I think a lot depends, of course, on Philip Forsberg. I think a lot depends on what is David Poyle going to do with Luke Cunnan. Um, But if it were me and I got to construct this roster, keeping Philip Forsberg, that would be the second line I would do. I would do Johansson, Miller, and Tanner Janot. And I mean, my mind goes to amazing places. <laughs> that is a great line. Right there. I mean. Yeah. And if Philip Forsberg does leave and you don't bring in uh, somebody else, you know, hey, maybe that opens the door for – like somebody like Tanner, not Tanner Janot, uh, Phil Tomasino, Tomasino to play mm-hmm. on that first line in an elevated role. 
Uh, yes. I agree. I would, you know, depending on what happens, I would like to see maybe Tanner Janot get bumped up um, just because I think it might be easier to find a replacement to play like him on the third mm-hmm. than it is to kind of find a player like him that can be able to play up and down the lineup. So yeah. I like it. I love the idea of uh, Johansson, um, Jano and Miller together. That is. Yeah, fantastic. that's like the chunk puff line right there. That is that's the chunk puff is, line. Okay. That, as the a, puff that line. will be the line. Yes. <laughs> um, all right. So let's talk about price, shall we? Because yeah. this ain't going to be cheap. No. Uh, like we mentioned, there is a lot of teams that could potentially be kicking the tires on JT Miller. Mm -hmm. Uh, Of course, you got guys like LA Kings and New York Rangers that are, uh, you know, trying to- In the rumored mix. After Ford core. Boston's always looking for people. The Penguins and Knights are always kind of shaking things up. But uh, yeah, according to Sportsnet, the Predators are kind of right there in the mix too. So uh, yeah. What's the deal for JT Miller? Yeah, this one is tough because you look at kind of what Vancouver is is looking for. And I think they're kind of looking for um, some younger talent, but that's not going to take a, a real long time to develop. I think they're looking for some sooner rather than later effect. And I look at what the National Predators might have to offer in trade, and I don't like what I see <laughs> because, you know, somebody like Ellie Tolvanen, I don't want to see that happen, but wait, what? For just, JT Miller, I would take no, that. No, I'm not. Heartbeat. I'm not saying only. I'm not saying only, but I'm. I'm I saying mean, yeah, but yeah. Um, so Ellie Tolvanen, I can see. Um, I worry about people like Cody Glass. You know, just mm-hmm. there's a couple of people where I'm like, if you combine some of these smaller pieces, you really. It has to really be worth it, JT Miller. I don't know. I don't know. This is where this is where I'm like, I'm not great at this because yeah. I just don't want to part with some of these guys. Yeah. I don't want to send somebody to Vancouver and watch them flourish. It's apparently very, very, very high, the Canucks asking price for Miller. And when mm-hmm. you think about it, like I said, he's got a team-friendly contract. A he does entire year left on his deal at just over $5 million AAV. So even like strapped for cash contenders can make that worth. Um, but I mean, basically it's, they're kind of looking for what the Sabres got for Jack Eichel, which is multiple first round picks, a young player who can play right now, mm-hmm. a young player that can kind of develop into something in the future And yeah, other than the first round pick, a lot of other draft picks or maybe a bonus prospect thrown in. Number one, I'm not sure if Vancouver is going to get that, to Uh be perfectly frank, um, because I think they know like the Canucks backs are against the wall. Now, the Canucks ended last year on a very, very good run. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, this may be a Forsberg situation where if the Canucks think they have a chance to maybe sort of sneak into the playoffs next season. Maybe it's worth keeping JT Miller around for one more season, knowing that he may not be back the year after next, just to kind of see where they go. And if things fall apart, you can kind of trade him at the deadline. So I I think a lot of teams know that Vancouver's backs are against the wall here a little bit. But the Canucks know that also, like, if there is a team that really wants JT Miller, they're going to go have to go out and be aggressive to get him. Yes. And for me, it's like, well, are the Predators in a position to do that? We know David Poyle will be aggressive. It's Mm -hmm. just, does he have what Vancouver wants? Right. And would he be willing to give that up? Because, you know, look, I I love Ellie Tolvanen. He's part of this package. I don't care. <laughs> Same for Cody Glass. Wow. I think for me, like Askarov is somebody I would be hesitant about. Tomasino mm-hmm. is somebody I would be hesitant about. Yes. Maybe Luke Evangelista, although I'm sure he is going to be a mm-hmm. part of any sort of asking price. Yes. For Vancouver. 
Um, and, you know, this is this is going to be a hot take for a lot of, you know, people pushing for a rebuild. I don't put that much value in first round picks, especially where the Preds wind up, because I do think you can if you draft well, you can get good players anywhere in the draft. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's not the part of the problem. The part of the problem is. A, who's the young player that can play right now that they're going right. to want? Which that scares me because are we talking about Tanner Janot? Are we talking about Alex oh, Carrier? Heck no. Are we talking about mm -mm. Phil Tomasino? Mm -mm. And then who's the prospect they want? And Nashville's prospect right. pool isn't that great compared There's to There's a other couple. Teams. There's that... a couple. There's a couple of not even blue chips. There's a couple of pretty good prospects. Mm -hmm. So that to me is like what scares me. Me too. Me too. Because, the, and I'm with you. There's a couple prospects that I would be very hard pressed to want to give up. I agree with you. I think Luke Evangelista has worked himself into a position of being in conversations when it comes to things like trades. But like you so Parsonen, like I don't, I really would hate to see him go. Um, I wonder about, you know, we talked about Cody Glass. I wonder about that. And, and so I don't know if the Predators have enough to offer for the right now piece for what Vancouver's looking for. And there's just a couple of prospects I would be very hesitant to let go of at this point. And I think those are going to be the ones that people are looking at. Yeah. So would it be worth it, though, in your mind to bring in JT Miller maybe for one season. I mean, it would depend on what it would cost me. And I look, I, I, I really would like to see the chunk puff line. Like I really would like to see that line. So I would be open to conversation about it, but I think it's going to come at, um, at, at a pretty steep price because there's going to be so many people kind of dipping their toes in this water. So, you know, I, I'm open to conversation. How about you? I mean, like, what what's your not that's too high? Here's the thing. I have one question. Oh, gosh. Does this get Nashville closer to a cup? And if it does, yes. Yes, yeah. it is worth it. Any price is worth it. If it gets Nashville closer to a cup. A cup. Yeah. That's a big if. That's a big but if. Any trade that can get Nashville close to a cup right now, not 10 years down the line, but right now, mm -hmm. if you can do it, it's worth it. Yeah, that's – yeah. Well, we'll yeah. see. Let us know what you think about uh, JT Miller potentially mm -hmm. coming to the Nashville Predators. Uh, there's other trade targets out out there as well linked to the Nashville Predators. And we're going to be yes. kind of doing breakdowns on all of them uh, up until the uh, start of the NHL free agency and player movement and all that good stuff. So, uh, hey, if there is a prospect or a prize player out there that you think the Nashville Predators should go after, by all means, tweet us, mention us in the YouTube comments, and uh, we will talk about it. We will break mm -hmm. it down on one of our future shows until though then until though i got it okay hey ann yeah. <laughs> where can the people find your work <laughs> you can find my work at on the and you can find me on twitter at ann k underscore mama on ice I'm Nick Morgan. You can find my work at onthefortcheck.com. Follow me on Twitter, underscore NS Morgan. While you're there, also be sure to follow the podcast at LO underscore Predators. If you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to like the video, subscribe, and leave a comment. Helps us get this video out to more Preds fans like yourself. That's going to do it for us today on the Locked on Predators podcast. Thank you for making us your first listen of the day every single day. We'll be back tomorrow with an all-new episode. See you then.